So we're going to go ahead and um, start back. So good morning to everybody. We're getting close to afternoon though. So um, I'm Dr. Antoinette Justice. I'm one of the clinical faculty here at the Kentucky College of Osteopathic Medicine. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to be talking to you all today about um, osteopathic manipulative treatment, but you'll hear me term it, call it OMT. That's usually the term that everybody hears as a treatment for chronic pain, um, as an alternative for opiates. I have a couple of our third year students with me today. Here um, is Dr. Ste uh, student Dr. Stephanie Jones and student Dr. Uh, Shannon Garrison. So they'll actually be demonstrating a physical exam here in a little bit. So, of nothing to disclose. So objectives for today, I want you all to become familiar with what osteopathic manipulative treatment is. Understand the benefit of OMT and chronic pain. The outline today is I'm going to initially define what osteopathic um, medicine and manipulative treatment is. I'm going to talk about how osteopathic medicine can benefit chronic pain. We're going to talk about using an osteopathic approach for diagnosis and treatment in patients and a case presentation. There we go. All right. So OMT, many of you may have heard the term, but you're not quite sure as to what it is. Um, so today I want to kind of help to explain a little bit more to those of you that are unfamiliar with what we do, okay? So OMT, or osteopathic manipulative treatment, we recognize in osteopathic medicine that the neuromusculoskeletal system is crucially important to optimal health in patients. George Northrup. He's a DO that was noted um, in Osteopathic Medicine and American Reformation. I'm going to read the quote that he has in there. The musculoskeletal system is intimately connected to all other systems of the body through both the voluntary and involuntary um, nervous system. Thus, indications are that the musculoskeletal system is a mirror of both health and disease, responding as it does to inflammation and pain from disorder in other body systems. What that's saying is, because you have a pathological diagnosis or a medical diagnosis, you can see musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal um, complaints or um, issues secondary to that. So when you assess the patient from an osteopathic uh, perspective, you want to consider the body as an integrated unit comprising multiple complex functions and interrelated structures. So this is what we teach our first year students. Um, if you have, if you would like to know, this is, this is the information, the background information that they get. All right. Another important principle in osteopathic medicine is that structure and function are intimately related. As abnormality in the structure of the body can lead to any abnormal function. So this is what I was saying in a patient that has a disease, you can see issues or presentation in the musculoskeletal system. This can be locally or distantly present um, in deranged structure. And to correct the medical, uh, mechanical disorders that you see, this is where an osteopathic physician will perform um, osteopathic manipulative treatment. This hands-on treatment is controlled and gentle, um, and it may be directed towards muscular tension, fascia. It can be towards uh, neural systems. Also, it can affect circulation, body fluids, and lymphatics. So the heart of osteopathy is the recognition of the body's ability to cure or heal itself, with some external health, of course. Um, many different pathologic conditions, um, the body can actually uh, take care of itself with little help. This tenet echoes from the belief enunciated by Hippocrates more than 2,000 years ago, which is really interesting. Our natures are the physicians for our diseases. So how do we assess a patient? So when a patient comes into our office, we're going to do a normal history and physical exam just like any other physician, but we're going to add a few things into that and ask a few more questions that someone else may not be asking because this is, these are things that are pertinent to how we are going to assess the patient. So a very detailed history of trauma, as the last speaker talked, trauma is very important um, because trauma can cause emotional trauma as well. So, you know, I want to know not only the injury that happened, the trauma, but the date, how it happened, the mechanism. If a patient fell, I want to know, did they fall on an outstretched hand? Did they fall back? Did they fall on their bottom? How did that happen? 
What was the cause of that fall? Did you slip or did you lose consciousness? Were you dizzy? What caused that? Also, I want to know what workup was done, when they were done, and what treatments were done. A very detailed surgical history. So type of surgery. Many patients forget that dental procedures are surgeries, and we see this very often. Patients will have headaches um, very commonly after a dental procedure, so that's important. Minor ER visits, patients will forget that as well. Mm -hmm. Something else that's important about surgery is when you know the type of surgery, it's important, but also because when patients, for certain surgeries, they have certain positions of their hands, their head, was the patient intubated, the positions of their legs. That's very helpful in me understanding, or another osteopathic physician, what could have happened during that surgery, and could they have had tight muscles or something happen? Maybe that area is an area we need to address. Uh, medications, this is very important too. When were they started? How is the patient taking the medications? Medications have to be taken some on an empty stomach. Are they taking them with supplements? Many supplements can affect the absorption of many medications. Are they, you know, um, uh, the other question um, with medications, are they on medications that counteract each other? Some medications can block um, the other medications, so that's very important to know if they're taking medications that do not work well together or interact together. Social history. Alcohol use, drug use, caffeine use, um, tobacco use, meds, herbs, sleep hygiene. Very, very important. When we sleep, this is when our body heals. If a patient is not sleeping, the patient is going to have issues. They're going to have severe fatigue during the day, but they're going to have a lot more pain. So we're going to ask a lot more questions about sleep hygiene and about their sleep. Many patients have undiagnosed sleep apnea. When you treat that, it affects their pain significantly. There's multiple reasons for that, but uh, we won't have time to talk about that today, but just know sleep is very, very important. Diet is important. Are they getting correct supplements? There's mul multiple nutritional deficiency that can cause pain. And so is the patient a vegan? Are they vegetarian? Are they um, just have a poor diet in general? So those are very, very important questions to ask. Also, um, food sensitivities exercise habits. I just went to um, a conference recently and the rheumatologist there was talking about there's an increased um, diagnosis of hypothyroidism and they're attributing it now to food sensitivities. And we've seen a lot in this area with gluten and dairy. So those are important things to ask patients. If I suspect that a patient may have a food sensitivity, I will have them keep a food diary and document down what they eat. If it goes in the mouth, it goes on that diary. When they come back in, we review that. And if they're having specific symptoms after they're eating a specific type of food, then we'll try an elimination diet. And that can significantly improve some patients' uh, pain. Exercise habits. We all know that <coughs> exercise is very, very important. Not everybody exercises, including myself, like we should. But exercise is something that's very important. However, if you have a patient that has fibromyalgia, the type of exercise that they do is also important. So if they're doing, let's say, aerobics or running, not the kind of exercise you want a fibromyalgia patient doing. You want them to do more walking, maybe yoga, something like that, maybe pool exercise. So that's important too. Living environment, the type of water they have, and any emotional stressors that's going on in their life. So family history. So we ask about parents, we ask about siblings, but we're also going to ask about their children. One thing that's interesting, um, when you think about family history, when you go back to maybe a grandma, sometimes things will skip generations. And they'll say, well, you know, I have all these issues, but my grandma had similar problems, but was never diagnosed. We have patients that are diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, so they have a hypermobility disorder. So asking patients about any family history, any grandparents, anybody that had any type of weird pain disorder, but no one ever diagnosed, and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, actually my great-grandmother or my grandmother, I've, I've heard the family talk about it. So that's important too. All right. Physical exam. So what do we do when a patient comes in to see us? So one of the things we're going to do is a neuro exam. We're going to look at cranial nerves 2 through 12. We're going to check for muscle strength, deep tendon reflexes. We're going to check for gait, that's walking. Any provoking maneuvers based on what they come in complaining of. 
and any other abnormalities based on physical exam that we find. An osteopathic structural exam to assess for any somatic dysfunction. We're going to demonstrate this in just a minute. So, all right. So many of you may be like asking, what is somatic dysfunction? So you'll hear that term come up multiple times. So when you think about somatic dysfunction, think about an impairment or loss of function in the body's framework or their skeletal system, okay? It can be joints, it can be skeleton, it can be myofascial, it can be vascular, lymphatic, it can be the autonomic nervous system. So these are multiple areas that we will address and look at. However, and I don't want you to get confused with this, not all somatic, dis um, somatic issues, issues are somatic dysfunctions. Fractures, um, sprains, inflammatory disorders, degenerative changes. These are not somatic dysfunctions, but you can have somatic dysfunction associated with these. All right, so how do we diagnose somatic dysfunction? Well, first we do a screen on the patient. We're gonna look for tissue texture changes. We're gonna look for asymmetry, maybe the vertebrae or other bones. We're gonna look for restriction of motion and for tenderness. Now, tenderness is not an objective finding, but if you find tenderness in an area that has loss of motion, then that kind of clues us in that we need to look a little bit further. So, I have two of my fellows, Dr. Garrison, student Dr. Jones are gonna demonstrate this for us today. Our students are trained very well from first year on. So I wanted them to be able to demonstrate this today for you all to see how much they actually know as a third year student. Next, we're just going to kind of move down that line, and we're looking at the angle. 
you have a grid symmetry. So this is uh, looking at the periodic curve if there's a problem. So just have a bend over. And then you just you have to get along here. You can use your hand or you can just visualize and she's symmetrical as you look at. So you also want to assess your patient seated. So I'm going to go ahead and have you take a seat. Um, because <laughs> the difference is
You can also take the time to assess the lumbar diagnosis <coughs> now that the erectile spinae are not fired. So I just put my hands underneath the lumbar spine, and I see do I have too much gap there? Do I have just the right amount of gap or no gap? Two sides of the gap. I also want to assess your breathing mechanism from the rib cage. So the major motion here is the anterior of your rib cage. So again, I'm going to keep the breath. And the major motion down here in the lower ribs is allowed to release the lower lateral. The jaw and cheek breathe as well. And I can also assess for her cervical ligaments in this way to see if she has way too much. Now we're going to use the uh, cone. had actually seen that before besides the students. Okay. So we're going to move on really quickly. It's time. So after you screen, you're going to treat the somatic dysfunctions that you find. Not all patients will have the same somatic dysfunctions, but many will have similar ones, especially a patient that has COPD or lung disease. You can see sternum and rib dysfunction in those. If we find a patient that has contraindications to treatment, we'll work them up or refer them to the appropriate specialist. So how does OMT affect pain? So um, chronic pain or chronic stress that can lead to chronic pain will affect the sympathetic nervous system. So this is a stress response. So this will affect the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis, that's a big long word. Um, so uh, this will cause increased cortisol this increased cortisol will decrease serotonin and dopamine. Now, serotonin and dopamine are part of the um, pain analgesia, so they affect pain. So when those go down, pain goes up, okay? 
So OMT may affect chronic stress and pain by affecting these um, physiological and psychological um, causes. So there's multiple OMT techniques that has been shown to um, produce autonomic homeostasis, so balance these. Um, an example of this is suboccipital inhibition. So your suboccipital mu muscles right here in the back of your head, your parasympathetic nerve one that does most of the body, the vagus nerve, this exits through the um, jugular foramen. And so by in doing some little technique to relax those muscles, you can help to increase uh, parasympathetic expression. All right, real fast, a case presentation. So a 59-year-old white female with a history of hypothyroidism, dermatomyositis, lupus, and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome on Coumadin, has been on chronic steroids since she was first diagnosed. She was on 180 milligrams uh, daily for three years. That's a really high dose. Um, she's down now to two milligrams daily. She also has insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, steroid-induced, and hypertension. She presented with bilateral severe shoulder pain, upper thoracic back pain, and rib pain. Um, she had restless leg uh, symptoms at night, um, history of low potassium, severe insomnia and fatigue. Her pain was 9 out of 10 daily. She struggled to take a shower, to vacuum, to cook, basically tying her shoes, anything. She did not want to go on opiates. It's a good thing um, for her uh, because it would have been very bad for her history. Um, but she was scared of becoming dependent on them. Long story short, uh, diagnosed her with significant sleep apnea. Um, she went on oxygen just based on the history, magnesium deficiency, and the patient was treated. Um, she came in every month, had 85% improvement in her pain symptoms. Looking at that patient's history, when you first read that, you would think, what am I gonna be able to do for that patient? But it's just amazing um, to listen to those patients and you find things that helps them significantly. So that was really, she was a really good case. I know we're trying to hurry for time. So if you're looking for a physician that does OMT, here's two links. You can find a neuromusculoskeletal uh, medicine physician that's a specialist um, in, in osteopathic manipulative treatment, but there's also many DOs that actually do OMT, so you can find them as well. All right, questions? Thank you.